insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Tomorrow, where we take a deeper look into how the issues of today will impact the world of tomorrow, from politics and world news to media and technology. We discuss how today's headlines are becoming tomorrow's reality. Welcome to Insights into Tomorrow. This is episode seven, Deadly Force. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my slightly out of frame <laughs> co host, Sam Whalen. Hello. How are you doing today, Sam? I'm doing fine. So, um, with everything that was, that's been going on with, in the wake of the George Floyd death and the protests and everything else, you and I had wanted to do something on the topic, but I think we kind of came to the conclusion that we probably are not qualified to do commentary on Black Lives Matter. Uh, so I thought the one thing that we could address from this whole thing is the the root cause of it, the the police use of deadly force. So that's what today's episode is going to be about. Any comments? Uh, well, before we get into it, I mean, even though we're not talking about Black Lives Matter, it's obviously still very important. So make sure you sign petitions, donate, things like that. Just because we're not talking about it, I don't want people to get the impression that we're, you know, stepping aside from it. We'd still, you know, fully support it, at least, you know. We, Absolutely. Yeah. And, and it, it is very good to mention that, you know, we aren't talking about it because I don't think we're the experts, we exactly. can't bring the perspective to mm -hmm. it. So I don't want to do it in a way, I don't want to cover it in a way that it can't be covered comprehensively and from the right angle. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we're the people that can do that. Yeah. So this is, this is our, our attempt at, at supporting Black Lives mm -hmm. Matter by bringing these things to the forefront. You know, these are really, the root cause of it is is really the the police violence and the 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 treatment of minorities by police and the profiling and everything else. And we're not going to get into everything, you know. And then this is not a, a an episode to bash police. This is really we wanted to draw attention to the fact that there are standards out there. There are mixed standards that are not applied evenly across the board, but there are standards out there that are intended to allow the police to do their job without having incidents like George Floyd happen. Mm -hmm. And sometimes those standards are not followed, and, and that's where we wind up in these situations, and that's what needs to be addressed. Yep. So with that in mind, are we ready to move forward? Yep. So the first thing I think we kind of need to do before we we dig into the the meat and potatoes of the subject is kind of define what deadly force is. So deadly force, you know, and this comes from Wikipedia, so it's a pretty generic definition. Uh, deadly force or lethal force is you is use of force that is likely to cause serious bodily injury or death to another person. In most jurisdictions, the use of deadly force is justified only under conditions of extreme necessity as a last resort. All lesser means have failed or cannot reasonably be employed. He goes on to say that firearms, bladed weapons, explosives, and vehicles are among those weapons the use of which is considered deadly force, the use of non-traditional weapons in an offensive manner, such as baseball bat, sharp pencil, higher iron, or other items may also be considered deadly force. 
So let's just take a second to talk about that. So in certain circumstances, police are authorized to use deadly force. But that does not give police the right to be judge, jury, and executioner. Uh, so there has to be some restraint placed on that. Did you have any comments on our definition that we're working off of? No, I think I think it's definitely accurate. I mean, it says uh, when all lesser means have failed. And I think that as we go on, we're going to see that it's not always – that's not always used as a last resort. That sometimes – well, more often than not, that deadly force is employed in situations where there were other options maybe or <sighs> – and it's 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 murky because the officer can always say that their life was in danger, which is which can be open to interpretation. But I do think that in this instance, the deadly force is should be used as a last resort. And you know, as I said, we'll go through and, and see how often that applies. Right. Um. So there are there is a legal standard for using deadly force by police. <clears throat> so broadly speaking, the use of deadly force by law enforcement is necessary and permitted under specific circumstances, such as self-defense or in defense of another individual or group. And this is kind of what you were mentioning where that's kind of the out, where if, if the officer says, well, I thought my life was in danger, in some jurisdictions that gives him the right to use deadly force, even if the person they're trying to apprehend is not committing crimes that warrant that level of, of response. The problem I think we've run into is that there is no single universally agreed upon set of rules for use of force. The International Association of Chiefs of Police has described the use of force as amount of effort required by police to compel compliance by an unwilling subject. Now, I think you'll agree that's a pretty vague standard that we have there. What concerns do you have about that standard that they have? Well, I mean, ultimately, the in the court of public opinion, you'd think that it would be more tr – you trust the police. You're supposed to trust your police. But in these instances, when, when they're the one that may hold all the power in these situations and it's their word before yours, they're the ones that get to write the narrative – in these situations. And I think that that can be dangerous, especially when you bring in things like systematic racism and profiling and things like that, which can skew an officer, what an officer may do and their motivations behind it. Right. Right. I agree. And, and, you know, it goes on to say that officers, they receive guidance from their individual agencies, but there's no federal mandate, let's say, for rules that govern when officers should use force. And, that use of force has to be taken, there's the context in which the situation is has to be taken into context. Uh, like, you know, there's no two situations that are the same and there are no two officers that are the same. So you're not, there isn't an automated response. Like it's, it's not like, it's not like machines, mm -hmm. you know, where you can perform the same thing over and over. The situations are always different. And in potentially threatening situations, an officer will quickly tailor the response to apply force. And, you know, looking at it from the perspective of a police officer, you don't have a lot of time in dangerous situations to make a decision. You know, sometimes people, let's, let's you know, a scenario that, that comes to mind is you're responding to an uh, alleged armed robbery. And you chase a subject into a dark alley, and the, the subject reaches into his pants to pull something out. As a police officer, you've got a split-second decision there to determine, is this guy pulling out his ID? Is he pulling out a gun? You know, is my life in danger? And in that split second is where tragedies happen. Situational awareness is also essential in these cases. Officers are trained to judge when a crisis requires the use of force and to regain control of a situation. Now, I, my concern there is that not all officers receive the same training. There's no uniform training across the board throughout the country. What are your thoughts on that? 
Um, I don't know if you watched last week tonight uh, with John Oliver, but I did, no. but they talk about this one specific kind of trainer that uh, it's almost like seminars that he goes around. This guy goes around the country and I forget his name. And he goes around the country and trains police. And he has this like predator mindset where he encourages police to be like apex predators. And so this guy has gone all around the country. So you have no idea what kind of training these officers are getting, just like you said, because there's no there's no set standard. So you could get certain places where they have very dangerous, you know, hunter killer mindsets. But in other in other situations, maybe they're encouraged to be more peaceful and less um reactive and, and violent so right. the fact that there's no standard leaves a lot of it up to to chance almost so it's worthwhile to talk about the amount of force that is used because i think we can all agree that when a police officer is responding to an incident and you have a non-cooperative suspect chances are you're going to have to use some kind of level of force whether that's vocal persuasion or you have to resort to physical use, whatever it is. So law enforcement officers should use only the amount of force necessary to mitigate the incident, make an arrest, or protect themselves and others from harm. Now, one of the problems that I have with that is you oftentimes have police that do things like engage in high-speed pursuits. You pull somebody over at a traffic stop, and they had a tail light out. And the police go up to question the individual, and the individual takes off, and then the police engage in a high speed pursuit. So now the original offense here is a broken traffic light. You can speculate on what else that person might be guilty of because of them fleeing, but is what they might be guilty of worth putting at risk? all the other pedestrians and drivers that are on the road through a high-speed chase. No, and I think that even not just high-speed chases, but that situation can be anything, right? And I'm sure we'll talk about it more once we get to specific cases. But at what point is a person's death warranted? <laughs> you exactly. Know, there's a, there, always, there always should be another way. Right. So there are levels. There's a continuum of police force uh, that's used which includes basic verbal and physical restraint, less lethal force, um, and as high as lethal forces. And the level of force that an officer uses varies based on situation. I think we can both agree on that. Because of this, guidelines for the use of force are based on many factors, including the officer's level of training or experience. Now, unfortunately, the research that I did didn't really delve too much into what level of force you can apply at your level of experience. But I think that's crucial. A lot of the incidents that we've seen recently have been very experienced officers who have been involved in these. So if the training is proportional to your experience and the level of force is proportional to your experience, I think we have a disconnect. And even then, you have to wonder if people in a situation where more cops are required if people are getting pushed to the academy faster than they should be who are we putting out on the streets with maybe less training but the just the same capability to use as much force as an experienced officer they still all have the same equipment you know on, on some level yeah i mean it so. doesn't take much to pull the trigger yeah but it takes a lot to know when to pull the trigger mm -hmm. um, an officer's goal is, is to regain control as soon as possible when protecting the community that control dynamic, I think, is what a lot of this uh, deadly force comes down to because the, the police are trained to operate from a level of authority. And when that authority is undermined, you tend to get an emotional response from the police. And that emotional response is fueled by the need for them to be in that, that authority dynamic. And when that fails, then things start to break down. The use of force is supposed to be an officer's last option, not, not their first. And it's sometimes a necessary course of action to restore safety in the community. Injuries may incur uh, with the use of force, and I think we can all agree that if you're being restrained because you're resisting arrest, there's a very good chance that an injury could occur. 
Police should ensure that the injured receive medical aid and that the family of any injured person is notified. That's where some of the dispute comes in with some of the latest incidents that we've had. Uh, For instance, we're going to talk about George Floyd a little bit more later in the show. But George Floyd had an officer kneeling on his neck for almost nine minutes. And three of those nine minutes, he was unresponsive, not breathing, and had no pulse. And none of the officers, when he was in that condition, attempted to render assistance. Well, there were also not just the one on his neck, but there were also other officers on his back and his legs. Yeah. Just pressing him into the ground. Yeah. And you can get, there's footage out there. The first one that, you know, blew up was the one of just the the officer with the knee on his neck. But later on, there was footage that came out of the other officers from the other side of the street watching, also pinning him down. It's horrific, it was horrific to watch. It is. I mean, it almost looks like he was executed. intentionally executed. Yeah. So the police use something called uh, the use of force continuum or the use of force spectrum. And, and that kind of tells you when to use what level of force. Uh, We're going to take a quick break, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about that in more detail. For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Civ Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. So the use of force continuum is really a kind of a spectrum of what level of force to use when in certain situations. Uh, The Supreme Court has recognized that the right to make an arrest or investigatory stop necessarily carries with it the right to use some degree of physical coercion or threat. Now that statement itself... (laughs) Sounds kind of scary. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of disturbing, isn't it? It it almost puts it in that they should go in with a hostile mindset. Exactly. Which is not what they should be doing. Which I think is exactly what is happening in a lot of situations. And when you see a lot of these movements to defund the police, it's driven by that mindset Mm -hmm. of every time you call 911, whether it's for a domestic dispute, a car accident, a heart attack, the first person to show up is a police officer with a gun and this mindset of I'm the authority. And that immediately puts a lot of people on a defensive posture at that point in time. Especially if they're, if the police are going to a situation that's already really tense and already right on the brink of like a powder keg almost, you have an officer show up who is armed and you know, that can, some that can, without the officer even doing anything, unfortunately can add another degree of tension to that situation. Absolutely. You're, you're injecting an aggressive mentality into a situation. that's already about to explode. Especially if it's in a, a situation dealing with, you know, uh, you know, minorities or low-income area because they're already suspicious of police to begin with because of police violence and, you know, things like that. Absolutely. So the degree of coercion or force used must be proportional to the threat and escalate only in response to the threat. Most law enforcement agencies have policies that guide their uh, use of force, but again, they're not applied evenly across the board throughout the country. The policies describe an escalating series of actions an officer may take to resolve the situation. This continuum generally has many levels, and officers are instructed to respond with a level of force appropriate to the situation at hand, acknowledging that the officer may move from one part of the continuum to another in a matter of seconds. So again, timing is of of the essence. So what we have here is an example 
of what a threat continuum is. So the first level is the most basic, officer presence. Police officer shows up, no force is needed. Uh, This is considered the best way to resolve a situation. Uh, The mere presence of a law enforcement officer works to deter crime and diffuse a situation. Officers' attitudes are professional and non-threatening. Hopefully, this is the majority of the interactions that you have with the police when they're called out for something. But like you said, even this can be an aggravating element to a situation. So the next level they have is what they call verbalization, where force, physical force is not required. Officers issue calm, non-threatening commands. Let me see your identification and registration. Officers may increase their volume, shorten their commands in an attempt to gain compliance. Uh, Short commands might include stop, don't move. Now, let me ask you, have you ever been pulled over by police? No, not yet. I mean, I've been in situations where I've dealt with police. Like, I've been in a car accident. I wasn't the one driving. I was a passenger. Um, I was pulled over. I wasn't the one pulled over. Again, I was a passenger. So I didn't have to talk to the police. The driver did. Um, So I've never really had any where it's I did something that the police need to talk to me. I've always been a passenger or someone on the sidelines. Right. So. Now I'll, I'll say I've been pulled over a couple of times by police. Once you were actually in the car and you were actually the reason that Not you really. went up getting pulled over. Uh, we had gone out somewhere, you being your mom and, and the car we were in broke down. Mm-hmm. So we had to use a pickup truck to get home. We had you in a car seat. That's how young you were at the time. And in order to put you in a car seat in a three-person seat in a pickup truck, Mm -hmm. your mom had to sit in the middle where there was no Mm seatbelt. So we got pulled over by police, and the police wanted to know why one of the passengers was in the middle because they couldn't see the car seat. They wanted to know why someone was in the middle and not in a Mm seatbelt. And this was kind of a learning experience for me because. You know, I pulled over, you know, pulled out the registration, all that stuff. Cop asked for it, asked me to get out of the truck and then walked me around the back of the truck. So I was out of traffic danger. And, you know, he's looking at my documentation and just casually, I put my hands in my pocket, not thinking anything of it. And he immediately triggers on that. He's like, uh, don't put your hands in your pocket. And I'm like, oh, sorry. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but in explaining the situation to him. He was very professional, totally understood the situation. I was cooperative with him the entire time, and he obviously let us go. But any time that people are driving and they have a police officer show up behind them with flashing their lights, that's kind of an anxiety situation there, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, I... I, um, I'm still kind of new to driving. I've been driving for like a little under a year. And one time I was coming back from college, which is like a 20 minute drive. Most of it's highway driving. And I had a cop behind me on the highway the whole time. And I wasn't doing anything wrong, but I was always looking behind me, looking at the cop, which, you know, distracts you from driving. Eventually he followed me all the way down to, um, there's a barbecue place nearby and he turned off. He was just getting some food, but he followed me for so long. I was, I was, it almost made me. I felt like I was more likely to get into an accident or do something wrong because I was so nervous about the cop behind me. Yeah, and and that sort of speaks to what you were saying with just having police involved changes the entire dynamic of a situation. People act differently. Uh, we had the, uh, the incident of the woman who was in um, Central Park, and oh, she yeah. didn't have her dog on a leash, and an African-American man who was in the park approached her and said, you need to have your dog on your leash. Well, she made a big deal about it, calling the police, saying this man was threatening her and everything, and basically leveraged what she knew was her power as a white privileged individual. That And she knew how the police were going to react to it. So that that guy's like, oh, God, that's such a bad situation. She's lucky she didn't get that guy killed. Yeah, it's 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 incredible. And, And but. The police response was so predictable that you knew how to manipulate the situation. Yeah, and talking about our experiences with police, again, there is the issue of race coming up. I mean, we're two we're two white men. Yep. And I think that I mean I've heard so many accounts from people of color that have been pulled over and their situations were entirely different. They're, Absolutely. The police are immediately suspicious in those situations of people that were doing nothing wrong. And I think that 
it's difficult to talk about these police issues without the issue of race. You know, yeah. you can't, the two are not, you know, they have to be brought together. I, I agree. But, and the reason that I mentioned my incident was I am a white guy. Right. So my experience was much better than a, a minority's experience would. And I was still terrified at what this police officer was going to do. Cause he, at that point in time, he wields all the power. Yeah. Um, and that's frightening. So moving down the spectrum, we get to open uh, empty hand control where a uh, officer uses bodily force to gain control of a situation. The soft techniques would be using grabs, holds, and joint locks. And you get to the hard techniques where you start throwing punches and kicks to restrain an individual. So this is where we start getting into that physical, potential yeah. for, for physical harm. The next step that they have is less lethal methods. Officers will use less lethal technologies to gain control of a situation uh, using blunt impact, using batons or projectiles. Uh, they can resort to chemicals using chemical sprays um, or projectiles, you know, pepper balls that they fire at you. These things are not less lethal. I mean, they, these can kill people. All the, I mean, there have been instances, I know, with the protests going on with chemicals, the use of tear gas and things, they can affect people, especially with breathing conditions or in your contacts. It can permanently blind you. And I, there was a woman at one point who I think she had asthma and the tear gas got in her lungs, and she died from it because she had a reaction to it. Yes. And yes. then uh, blunt impact, the use of a baton, I mean, that's pretty self-explanatory. You could, if somebody hits the concrete because you knocked them out with a baton, that's, I mean, that might be out of your hands and not your intention, but that could still kill them. Well, and you can still kill somebody with a blunt impact. Right. If I hit you on the head yeah. with a baton, I can cause brain damage and kill you. And the last one, the uh, CEDs are conducted energy devices to immobilize a target. Tasers, right? That's what, That's what your yeah. tasers are, yeah. Those have set people on fire in some instances, stop people's hearts if they've got pacemakers that the officer is aware, unaware of. Yep. And look, I understand that if someone with a pacemaker – tries to pull a gun on the police officer, the cop's not going to have time to worry about that to tase him. But it's still, it's it's these methods that we're using that even if we're trying to make them less lethal, there is still the potential for killing somebody. And I think the problem we have with these is labeling them as less than lethal generates this air of casualness mm -hmm. about them. Like, oh, well, if you're acting up, I can just tase you. Right. And, and that'll sell you right down. And I don't have to wrestle you to the ground at that point in time. And you can kill somebody with it, you know, either through electrocuting them, stopping their heart, or when they go down, it's very easy for them to hit their head and, and whatever because you're uncontrolled when you go down. You see these demonstrations of tasers, you know, with the police academy. And I've been tased in the past in a demonstration. It's not pleasant, you know, and it took three people to hold on to me and, and gently put me down on the ground. Can you imagine if someone my size was tased yeah. without that kind of restraint? I hit, we'd hit the ground hard. Yeah. It's, it's frightening. And then obviously the last level that we have in the continuum is lethal force. Officers use lethal weapons to gain control of a situation. Should only be used if a suspect poses a serious threat to the officer or another individual. Officers use deadly weapons such as firearms to stop an individual's actions. And this is an alternative. It has to be an alternative because the perpetrators, there are perpetrators out there that will use deadly force indiscriminately, whether it's targeted at police, at uh, citizens, or whatnot. We had an incident, I don't know, a year ago, two years ago, uh, near the Deptford Mall near us where shoplifters were identified, I guess, by the store security. The police were called, and the shoplifters got into a waiting car, and the car gunned it right at a police officer in its path, and the police officer pulled his weapon and fired and killed an individual in the car as a matter of self-defense, is what he claimed at the time. So... A car is a deadly weapon, and they tried to use it like that, if, if nothing else, to intimidate the police officer in, in vacating the way. Should the person have been killed for shoplifting? That's a pretty extreme. I think if they, if, 
in that instance, I know that I mentioned it earlier, the use, the use of the reasoning, uh, officer's life was threatened, but in that instance, they might've been if they were driving at the police officer. That's true. The problem that I have in that situation is you're in a crowded plaza. There are other citizens, other pedestrians around. What's the guarantee that you're not going to fire your weapon, discharge your weapon, miss the target, and then hit an innocent civilian for a shoplifter? That's where my a lot of my concern is. And that's not even mentioning that on the way over here, I was listening to the radio, and it was they were talking about what we're talking about now, the excessive use of police force. And in a lot of these instances, it's traffic stops, and an officer ends up pulling a gun. Because the person is not cooperating. And yes, the person should cooperate, but that doesn't give the officer the right to pull a gun. Right. Judging by what we just talked about, the officer should be pulling a gun when they feel their life's at risk. Exactly. Not because the person won't hand over their ID. Exactly. You know, use of threats, which the Supreme Court allows, does not necessarily mean threatening bodily harm with a weapon. Yeah, the, they played a, uh, a clip over here of a woman that recorded when she got pulled over, a woman, a person of color, and the p police officer straight up told her, I'm going to light you up. Like, they should not be saying things like this. And then that woman ended up dying, not in the traffic stop. Four days later, she was found hung in her cell. It was ruled as a suicide. Her family didn't believe that. But it's things like this where the use of firearms to, to, to intimidate yeah. is is a is a real problem yeah so let's take a, a quick break here and we'll come back and we're going to talk about what excessive force is and what unreasonable force is <laughs> so excessive force refers to situations where government officials and and we're not just talking police this this you know applies to military personnel as well when government officials legally entitled to use force exceed the minimum amount necessary to defuse an incident or to protect themselves and others. This can come up in different contexts, such as when handling prisoners or even during military operations. When it involves law enforcement, especially during an arrest, it's also referred to as police brutality. The constitutional right to be protected from excessive force is found in the reasonable search and seizure requirement of the Fourth Amendment, and the prohibition on cruel and unusual punishment is in the Eighth Amendment. So we're talking constitutional rights here. You know, this is this is something that should not be left up to an officer on the street to determine what your constitutional right is at this point in time. Yeah, but even even the wording there allows for loopholes, right? Reasonable search and seizure, um, cruel and unusual punishment too. Like a lot of these things can be twisted to waive those constitutional rights by an officer. Um, I feel like, and I think that that's where we get into the issues, is because a lot of these terms, even though they're right there in the Constitution, are purposely able to be manipulated and, and changed to allow for excessive force like this. And that's a perfectly valid point. And a lot of times. If you're going to challenge these field interpretations of yeah. the Constitution, you have to do that in a court of law before a judge. And in order to do that, you have to survive the encounter. And if you don't, then it's really not in your favor at that point, is it? Um, so unreasonable force um, in the Supreme Court case of Tennessee versus Garner the court found that police used excessive force by shooting an unarmed, non-threatening teenager in the head while fleeing a house he had burglarized. At the time, the Tennessee law authorized the use of, quote, all the necessary means to effect the arrest of fleeing suspects regardless of the situation. Which, what could possibly go wrong with that wording? Yeah, I, I mean, I guess going into it, he had burglarized a house, so that was their justification. He might, I mean, even it's, it says so non-threatening, so maybe they weren't aware that he wasn't armed. I, I don't know. Well, he's running away. Yeah. Who's he threatening while he's running away? Not to mention that they're not supposed to shoot you in the head, right? They're, not, they're supposed to be aimed for center mass, yeah. right. So the court overturned the state law because it allowed for unreasonable use of force in violation of the Fourth Amendment. So again, we have to appeal to the courts. Doesn't do anything for the victim in this case. But hopefully we get some reform later on that it solves some of these problems. 
The court ruled that deadly force can only be used during an arrest if necessary if it's necessary to prevent the escape and the officer has probable cause to believe the suspect poses a significant threat of death or serious injury to the officers or others. See, there's that there's that loophole wording again, you know? I feel like, again, the officer, it, it goes to the office. The officer is the one that has to determine it. So, again, we get back to what we talked about before, making those split-second decisions in the field. What is probable cause in any given situation if they're all different, you know? Yeah, well, and I think in this case here, let's go back to that play, that scenario we talked about in Defert with the shoplifter. So somebody flooring it in the parking lot there trying to kill an officer, let's say, could easily be construed as being dangerous to anybody else in that plaza as well. So there it probably would be justified based on these rules. Yep. Here, if this kid is running away from the police, even if he had a gun, if he's not firing that gun off indiscriminately at other people, he's not immediately a, yeah. a threat. And then necessary to prevent escape if the, the kid was on foot, I mean, the police, there had to be another way. Yeah, you can't run the radio, yeah. right? So police can easily call in back up for situations mm -hmm. like that. So they go on to summarize and say excessive force by police brutality doesn't just apply to cases of deadly force, but can also be found where injuries are relatively minor, but resulted from the unreasonable use of force. So the, the headlines today are dealing with unfortunate deaths, which are obviously a concern. But it doesn't, you don't have to die in order to have a case against the police for unreasonable force. Uh, they could easily cause long-term permanent injury that, that's covered as well. So let's take a quick break. We'll come back. And we're going to talk about some ways that you might be able to find some protections uh, available. <music> So excessive force is a constitutional violation that can be remedied by filing civil rights complaints for monetary or injunctive relief under Section 1983 of the U United States Code. Okay, so if you survive the encounter, you can sue. I'm not sure that that's something that leaves a lot of comfort for the people that are victimized by this? Well, that's if you can even afford to sue, right? I mean, the legal fees are going to get out of, out of control, especially when these cops are typically backed by unions, which are going to, you know, go to bat for them no matter what. No matter, And we're seeing that a lot now with the protests and then subsequent officers getting fired or, uh, what is it, paid leave, things like that. Right. But police unions are some of the biggest obstacles, and I know that we have a section on that coming up, but they're some of the biggest obstacles in any kind of actual law um, you know, civil suits or civil rights complaints, things like that. Absolutely. Now, you can also file a complaint with the United States Department of Justice who might decide to investigate your case, although that's optional for them. Uh, when deciding whether a government official such as a police officer engaged in excessive force, courts look at the totality of circumstances to determine whether the actions are objectively reasonable. In making this determination, judges use the perspective of a reasonable officer on the scene lacking the benefit of hindsight. Now, let's take that statement for a second there. What is a reasonable officer? Maybe they had a bad day. Maybe they had a bad morning. You that's know, bad uh, cup of coffee. Right. That's the thing. You've got human error written all over this because you don't know what mindset that person was in. You don't know if that person was an anti-Semite and dealing with a Jewish suspect or a racist dealing with an African-American suspect. And it completely changes the mindset. Yeah. And I kind of think I'm kind of of the mind where these things are worded intentionally that the officers are always portrayed in this positive light in these kind of situations, even if they were the ones that took a life unnecessarily. They're the reasonable officer. They're without the benefit of hindsight, you know, things like this. I, this well, is where the systematic aspect of it comes in. You know? It is. And, and again, I don't want to turn this into let's bash the no, police I know, because I, know. I think, I think the vast majority of law enforcement officers out there are genuinely interested in enforcing the law and protecting people. But there are bad cops. We know there are bad cops. And the system itself does a very poor job of weeding out these bad cops. 
And and the bad cop argument is always because that argument would never apply to any other profession. If a surgeon kills ten people, they're not gonna they'll they'll fire the surgeon. He'll get malpractice. He'll lose his license. If a cop kills someone like George Floyd or or Breonna Taylor, who's murderers or, or not murderers, that's a that's a different subject. But those officers are still free to go. And and in situations like that where people are are killed for no reason, the bad apples are not taken care of. I properly. agree. Yeah. And and when we get to the the uh, George Floyd case, we'll talk about that in more detail. Yeah. I hopefully what we're seeing today is going to change that. But yes, you're right. Traditionally, that's been the case. I do think that also today this what we're living through now is important because you have things like social media and public outcry that I think is making a lot of sweeping change to get rid of and tend to help the systematic issues that we're we're seeing now. People are calling it out. People are, yeah. are saying when they see it. So it's it's less obvious to hide. We we have a lot more tools today to point out the yep. injustices that we had mm-hmm. ten years ago. Um so in in talking about you know what remediation you have we're talking about this perspective of a reasonable officer so the courts analyze factors such as the severity of the underlying crime or circumstances which you know you look at the Eric Garner case where he was allegedly selling illegal cigarettes and was executed for it i think we had a breakdown in the system there They look at whether an immediate threat to safety of an officer or others exist. Perfectly reasonable. They look at whether the individual was actively resisting arrest or attempting to flee. Last time I checked, resisting arrest was not punishable by death. So, might have to throw that one out too. They look at whether there were alternatives that were available or whether warnings were provided that or could have been provided. So, and again, we're not talking about death in all of these. We're, we're talking about excessive force. So th- these, these all do apply here. But again, the, the goal of this is to look at what the end game is on this here. And, and recently in the news, the end game has been executions. Yeah. And uh, another argument that's usually used to defend uh, police that use excessive force is the whether warnings were provided or could have been provided. People say, oh, well, why didn't, why didn't they just comply? Why didn't they just stop resisting? And it's not always that simple, especially if they're seriously injured. I, they they might have been scared, yeah. <laughs> scared for their life. You know, if they're in pain or, I don't know, it's not as simple as, oh, you just ignored a warning, you know? And I think it's a lot of, it's not as black and white as... as well, and the, the problem that you have is the police are propagating this problem themselves with all of these incidents, if if there's a high percentage chance of an African American getting pulled over by police and dying, then they're going to avoid being pulled over at all costs. Yep. Because I don't care if I have a broken tail light, you don't get to kill me for it. So that excessive use of por- force, and it's you know the majority of let's just say traffic stops. The majority of traffic stops in this country every day go off without a hitch. There aren't any problems. The ones that are the issues that we're talking about are the ones that are getting all the social media attention. They're the outlying ones, but these obviously need to be addressed because these are the ones that are resulting in people dying. So they go on to say that along with deferring to law enforcement reasonableness standards, courts can also give officers qualified immunity. This protects public officials from civil liability for violations of rights so long as they were reasonably performing their duties and the rights involved were not clearly established. Now, this is where I have a problem. It's like diplomatic immunity. (laughs) It is. And at what point in time and and – what court in this country has the right to deny someone their civil liberty rights? You, you don't. Even the Supreme Court cannot deny you your rights under the Constitution. So this whole idea of qualified immunity, I think, is a bad precedent that we have floating over mm-hmm. us. And it, it starts to blur the line between, like, protectors and and uh, guards almost, you know, where like where their job is no longer to protect – because they can get away with whatever they want. That's you know? exactly it. If you remove the consequences of someone's actions, 
they're not going to have any restraint whatsoever yeah. on those actions. It reminds me of, and Watchmen on HBO is a great show that deals with a lot of this, but there's a quote from the original book where it says, who watches the Watchmen? Who watches, who who oversees, you know, these, these type of officials? Right. So they go on to kind of elaborate and say, in excessive force cases, uh, qualified immunity can protect police officers in harder to evaluate situations where there's a hazy border between excessive and acceptable force. Yikes. <laughs> That's exactly what you don't want. You don't want to protect them there because you want them to understand the decision that I'm about to make in pulling this trigger is going to have consequences. And if there's no consequences associated with it, they're going to feel far more at ease to pull, to pull that trigger. And it, it makes excessive force a more likely option to exactly. which we talked about before, because if there isn't consequences and if there's a hazy border between excessive and acceptable, then what's the difference? Right. E excessive becomes the new acceptable. What the courts need to do is remove that haziness. You know, you need to make sure that your people are trained, make sure that the situations are well understood, make sure that the reason that this guy is pulling his gun on a suspect is because he needs to. Yeah. Which comes with holding people account, holding officers accountable, which is not, What's happening? Absolutely. So they say the benefit of this immunity, uh, officers would need to show that a reasonable person in their position wouldn't have known that their actions violated clearly established law. And I think that's probably the wrong. Like, you need to have that, that, that measure, but you also need to prove that you were in a reasonable state of mind at that time, too. If I look back at a situation like, for instance, I'm going to, I'm going to, we're almost there, but I'm going to jump ahead real quick to George Floyd. Okay. So George Floyd was ultimately executed, allegedly, because it hasn't been proven in court yet, by Officer Derek Chauvin. Now, if we look at Derek Chauvin, prior to this incident, he had 18 complaints on his official record two of which ended in discipline, including letters of reprimand. He'd been involved in three police shootings, one of which was fatal. And he had had a reputation at a club that he was a bodyguard, uh, a bouncer at, of using excessive force on minority crowns. How are you going to explain to me when you're dealing with a man who, by the way, George Floyd worked at the same club as a bouncer too, how are you going to explain to me that you're handling this individual with a record like that and that you're in a reasonable state of mind? You're not. Not to mention that even what he won medals for involved killing people as well. I mean, sure, it was for a suspect that pointed a shotgun at him, a domestic violence incident where he broke down the door and shot at someone who reached for a pistol. In those things, it's yeah, he was probably at risk. But he still killed people right. and got rewarded for it, which in his own mind would be – Fuels positive. that mentality. Yeah. 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 So, all right. Let's, let's step back a second. I wanted to talk about some examples of unjustified deadly force. Mm -hmm. So the first one I think that, that really kicked off the awareness campaign in recent memory was Eric Garner, 17th of July, 2014. So he was allegedly selling illegal cigarettes on the streets of New York on Staten Island. He wasn't threatening anyone or being violent towards the officers. The officers attempted to make an arrest and wrestled Garner to the ground and then put him in a chokehold, which even at that time was an illegal hold for police. But they still employed it. Gardner repeatedly said he can't breathe. And this is where a lot of our Black Lives, movement, uh, Black Lives Matter movement comes from here. And that's why Black Lives Matter focuses on the, the choking of him at this point in time. So the officers continued to press his head into the ground and kept him in a chokehold. He suffered neck injuries and died because of these compressions. The case was considered to show police officers using illegal maneuvers and excessive force. However, neither of the officers involved were charged with a crime. The officer who put Garner in a chokehold was stripped of his badge and his gun, and the supervisor was charged with failure to supervise and stripped of her badge and gun. So you can kill someone. You just got to give up your badge and gun. Right. And I think that that 
that's where a lot of the issues come in. It they murdered him, you know? That's that's if it wasn't a cop, if it was anybody else, they would be going to jail. Like and I don't think they'd be able to get out of it. And I think I could be wrong, but there is footage of this, right? There is footage. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And it's it's tough to watch, but I do think it is necessary to watch. Um because you can see you can read about this in the paper. You can read about, you know, the excessive force, but when you see someone die from this, it gives you an entirely different perspective because it makes it real. And and you see the almost the casualness of it and how it's just, they're just holding him. Yeah. And then he's just gone, you know? Yeah. And I think it's, it's important that people see that. Well, and, and there was an explosion of similar yep. uh, incidents like this afterwards where chokeholds, you know, became somehow a popular form of restraint. Um, so let's, you know, we're going to take a big leap here. and We're going to jump forward to George Floyd, um, which kind of spurred all of this. So I want to make sure we give him proper time. Now, George Floyd was a 46-year-old. He was killed by, as we said, Officer Derek Chauvin in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Now, George Floyd himself was not an angel. And, and I make no attempt to paint him as one. He had been charged with, I think, eight. He would charge eight times for violent offenses between 97 and 2005. So the man had a reputation, but after his last arrest, he was trying to turn things around. Uh, he was a hip-hop artist. He was a mentor in his religious community. Uh, he became more involved in Resurrection Houston at the time, which was a Christian church and ministry where he mentored young men. He helped his mother recuperate after she had a stroke. He delivered meals and assisted others, uh, other projects with Angel by Nature Foundation. He became involved with a ministry that brought men from the Third Ward to Minnesota in a church work program with drug rehabilitation. And he had been involved in drugs and, and so forth. So he came from a difficult background, and he was a product of that background. His, his criminal background was, was tied up largely with that. But he had made a conscious decision to try to straighten things out in his life. And he winds up dying in the process of this entire incident. How does that make you feel as an individual? I mean... There's there's a thing with I see it a lot in like right leaning media where they take his record and they use that to justify what happened to him. And it's not that some people are not black, like black and white, like I mentioned earlier. They're not it's not no one's all good and no one's all bad. So what bothers me is when his record is brought up as a way to almost justify what happened to him. And it, it, it's not nothing should justify what happened to him. It was horrible. Again, I mentioned it with Eric Garner. But there's footage of what happened to George Floyd, and everybody should go and watch it because it's something that people need to see. It's horrible, and it's slow, and you don't realize how long eight minutes is until you're watching this man die in front of you. And, I, and his record doesn't – obviously, it's important because it was – he did things that were bad in his past, but he was trying to turn things around. And I, he – the initial – thing happened because he was using a fake bill right or a fake he had a counterfeit 20 that he was trying to yeah pass off. doesn't mean he should be killed you know yeah. and it's just it's we've seen so many between 2014 with eric garner and before up to george floyd so many of these cases where these men are just killed and nothing happens but george floyd proved to be different well and and you're right and i mentioned his record here just so that people understand what his background mm -hmm. is no i understand None of the eight previous offenses he had had a death penalty associated with them. What he was involved with when he was accosted by police did not carry a death penalty. Yet he's dead at the hands of the police. And that really is what the problem is. You had four police officers on the scene at the time, three of them holding him down, one of them keeping the pedestrians back. Not one of them rendered assistance when he stopped breathing. When he was told, I can't breathe, Chauvin told him, stop talking. That takes a lot of breath. No one checked a pulse. He was still being knelt on when the emergency services arrived to attend to him. 
that's a problem. Yeah, and even if even if you make the the officer can make the justification, you know, I was just holding him down. The he said he couldn't breathe, and you continued to do it, and he was handcuffed already. Yeah, right. He was already restrained. What mm-hmm. was he going to do? There was no need. Obviously, there was no need for for any of that. And it's good that obviously it's not good that he's dead, but it's good that everybody saw what happened and that it sparked something in a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. So a month later, we have Richard Brooks. 12th June, 2020. A 27-year-old African-American was shot and killed by Atlanta police, a police officer, Garrett Rolfe. Uh, Officer uh, Devin Brosden responded to a complaint that Brooks was asleep in a car blocking a restaurant drive through lane. Rolfe arrived after Brosden radioed for assistance some minutes later after a breathalyzer exam indicated that Brooks's blood alcohol content was above the legal limit for driving, Ruff and Brosnan began to handcuff Brooks. Brooks scuffled with the officers, got a hold of Brosnan's taser, punched Rolf, and ran. So, and if you watch this video, again, a lot of video. You had police body cam, you had uh, pedestrian footage from uh, cameras, from phones, and you had security footage from the Wendy's where this happened. The incident was fine up until Brooks ran. So with Rolf pursuing him, Brooks turned to fire the taser toward Rolf, who then shot Brooks twice in the back, and a third shot struck an occupied car. Brooks died after surgery. Footage of the incident from the officer's body cams from witnesses' phones and from the restaurant security cams were widely broadcast. Rolf was fired, Brosnan was placed on administrative duty, and Police Chief Erica Shields resigned the following day. Based on the videos and witness reports, prosecutors claim, prior to a completed investigation by the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, that after Brooks was shot, Rolf kicked Brooks and Brosnan stood on his shoulder, Rolf has been charged with felony murder and 10 other offenses, Brosnan with aggravated assault and two counts of violation of oath. This is a tough one in watching the incident here. It's clear that the suspect resisted arrest. I don't think anyone's going to dispute that. Wrestled a weapon away from the police and began to flee. That weapon by the police's own definition, was a less than lethal weapon. He turned and discharged that weapon at the police, who responded with a lethal weapon. What's your reaction to that? I haven't, I haven't seen the footage of this one, so I just want to put that out there before okay. I say anything else. Um, it is a tough situation, um, and it's, it's difficult because I don't know... Obviously, they should not have shot him twice in the back, right? But the fact that he was firing a weapon back at the officers makes it really, it makes it almost easier to spin it where it was justified this time, you know? And I don't know. It, that That's a difficult one. I really, I mean, it's charged with felony murder. That's more than, well, I think Chauvin got, what, second degree? I think we second, have it here. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's interesting that response being so swift, I guess, right, where it's om- it's a little bit more murky, whereas a por- opposed to George Floyd, where that was pretty clear cut what happened there. It's interesting the different responses to these two situations. Well, and I chalk that difference in response up to the fact that this was a month after the George yeah. Floyd case. So it's a different world. It was very heightened. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the concern that I have is the situation in which that firearm was discharged did not meet the minimum criteria that have been required okay the the situation was the suspect was fleeing did not have a deadly weapon was not posing a threat to anyone else even though he discharged a less than lethal weapon at the police that basic premise of he was not a danger to someone else wasn't there so execute him as he ran away I think kind of violates what that standard is. Not to mention that the police also hit a occupied car, right? And there's my other concern. So you're in a busy drive through in a, in a residential area and you're indiscriminately firing your firearm three times. 
hitting the suspect twice? And what did you need the third shot for if you already hit him twice? Yeah, that, that it could have been somebody relatively innocent could have been killed with no warning, really. Yeah. We live in a very difficult time right now, as demonstrated by just these three incidents here. Uh, and, and I think the future is, if nothing else, there's going to be change. And we're going to, we're running, you know, we're already at the one hour mark. So we're a little late here, but I think the topic is worth spending the time on. Mm -hmm. We're going to take a quick break and we're going to come back and we're going to talk about where we think the future is going to go with this. <laughs> Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. So demonstrators have delivered a clear message in the days since George Floyd was killed about how America's police force has to change in the way they treat black people. And, and that change needs to happen now. Here's a partial list of some of the things that are changing right now as a result of these. So there's been changes to tactical rules. Dallas and Minneapolis have mandated officers intervene when a colleague is using excessive force. I'm not really sure what that means. Um, they intervened when Chauvin was using excessive force on George Floyd. Of course, they intervened by restraining Floyd even further. So I'm curious to see what the details of those are. Uh, Seattle banned uh, the covering of badge numbers so that, you know, you could find out who these police were. They also banned chokeholds and tear gas. Minneapolis banned chokeholds. Houston banned chokeholds. The fact that these weren't banned before this, I think it's kind of disturbing. New York banned chokeholds and repealed a law that sealed records of officer misconduct from the public. Not sure why that was in place. Philadelphia banned tear gas and other non-lethal methods. Connecticut has banned chokeholds and prohibited state emergency services from buying military-grade equipment from the federal government. Why local police need to buy military-grade equipment from the federal government? That's beyond me. That's, that's, we can make a whole other show about that. Um, just the, and it's like we talk about excessive force. When you have access to this kind of equipment, it's almost, it seems almost inevitable, right? Yeah. Why, and sure, if you're policing a high crime area, you might need better equipment to protect yourselves, but you don't need like assault rifles and tanks. Even my town, I live in a relatively small town. They bought like an APC like two years ago, and it's just ridiculous. And people did speak out about it then, but. It's like, and when we get into defunding the police, these are the kind of things we talk about. You don't need the amount of money that they're getting. Yep. So they're also talking about budget cuts and defunding the police. So Los Angeles has considered cutting police budget by up to $150 million. New York City has considered cutting but hasn't disclosed specific numbers. Minneapolis, under defunding, Minneapolis' city council passed a resolution to replace its police department with a community-centric model. Now, that's an interesting concept in and of itself. This whole concept, before I go on my tirade, what are your thoughts on defunding the police? I mean, I think it's definitely something that needs to happen. And I'm not saying people tend to take it and twist it as in we're going to get rid of all cops and, and you know, you're going to call 911 and no one's going to pick up, Right. Not to mention that that already happens sometimes in some places due to, you know, just how the area is spread out. But I think if if groups like teachers and doctors, especially we just saw with the pandemic, don't have access to the resources they need to do their jobs effectively, which then has ripple effects for the rest of a community. Doctors being people getting sick, 
teachers being education is, you know, not happening. I think that defunding of the police would help redistribute that money to programs that are better impactful and in the long run may reduce crime if people are better, better educated and have access to better medical care, you know. And I think you're right. I, I think the important thing here is the concept of defunding the police is not disbanding the yeah, police. Right. The concept of defunding the police is a restructuring of what that dynamic is. Right now, like we mentioned earlier, you pick up the phone, call 911, you get a trained aggressor with a gun showing up at your door, regardless of what you're calling for. And that is not always the best thing for situations. The idea of having a community-centric model would have perhaps counselors that show up during a domestic dispute. So instead of having a police officer show up trying to resolve something that they're completely untrained to do, you've got people who are trained to defuse these situations. You do not put a police officer in front of a hostage, uh, a hostage taker and expect them to resolve the situation. You put a hostage negotiator in front. They're specially trained to deal with these situations. So defunding the police is about changing how we respond. It's about taking assault rifles out of the police. You know, at no point in time should a police officer be walking the streets with assault, assault rifles as they're providing protection to protesters. So when we say defund the police, it's not disband them. Yeah, and there was a particularly... I don't know how much you watched the cable television, but of course Trump is taking this defund the police and running with it. There's a particularly terrible ad where it's it's someone calling 911 and it goes to an automated system, yeah, dial one for murder, dial two for a home invasion, and then it cuts to like a burning city street and it's like this is what's going to happen if you defund the police. That's just blatant misinformation. Well, it is, and it's it's because Donald Trump just doesn't understand. Yeah. And Donald Trump is deliberately trying to manipulate right. what is a situation that is long in coming and long overdue, he's trying to manipulate that to ensure his own reelection. And I just, I don't want to fall down a Trump rabbit hole because it's so easy to do, but I just, if we're trying to define what defund the police is, I think there's so much propaganda and misinformation. And I just want to make sure that we acknowledge them. It is. And, and there have been successes in disbanding police. Okay. I'll point to Camden, New Jersey. Where it came to New Jersey, the, the corruption was so rife in the, in the police department that for years they tried to get to wean it out, and they couldn't. So eventually the city council disbanded the police. They had the state police come in and patrol, and then they went back and they rebuilt the police force. And one of the things that Camden is doing that is making it a success is there's a mandate by the uh, uh, chief of police in Camden that officers who come in and work in the police department have to walk the streets. They have to knock on doors. They have to talk to the residents on the street. They're building that relationship. It's a cooperative relationship that people have, and it's proving to be very effective in Camden at this point in time. The one criticism they have is that a lot of these police don't actually live in Camden. So, But that's something that can be resolved later. But moving on to things that are changing right now. So we have school contracts are getting canceled. So Minneapolis, Denver, and Portland have moved to end the presence of police officers in local schools. I'm not really sure that's a good idea given the number of school shootings that we've seen, but we'll see. Uh, officers have a presence in 25 biggest school districts nationwide at this point in time. So we'll see where that goes. Um, there's been a change to no-knock warrants. Uh, there's been a ban uh, in Louisville, Kentucky, where Brianna Taylor was killed by police officers who raided her home with this type of warrant. So that was what you were talking about earlier. Yeah, they were they were undercover cops too. So they it wasn't even clear that they were police. Um, so she was killed, and then when her boyfriend tried to intervene, because they were not wearing uniforms, he tried to help. And again, I don't. I we tried. I didn't want to bring her up because I don't have all the information, but he was either arrested or, or harmed as well. I yeah. So. so there's changes for that. So there's changes for police transparency. We spoke uh, briefly about New York removing the ban. 
lock down records on police officers who have been investigated for excessive force so you can get that information. The one problem that we do run into is disciplinary hurdles, and you touched on this earlier talking about police unions. It's ridiculously hard to fire police officers in the U.S., let alone get criminal charges to stick. Uh, chalk that up to unions, qualified immunity, weakness from elected officials, and it's a major roadblock to change. It's, it's that bureaucracy that we're ingrained in. Minneapolis Police Department said that it is withdrawing from negotiations with its police union. Uh, the real effect of that is yet to be determined. So what we do at the end of the show here is we, we try to look at all the factors and, and give an educated guess of where we think things are going. What do you think is going to happen? When do you think something's going to happen? And do you think that this is a lasting change? Or is this something that it's going to fade from the headlines and we're going to be right back in this position in months? Well, I hope that I hope that it is it continues. And I hope that people continue to protest and that movements continue to happen. I do think that there is a pretty clear effort by the just general media to suppress the coverage of these these protests. I mean, they focus on the looting instead of the peaceful protests that actually want change. And I think that is by design. And I, I hope that despite this di this di discouragement, excuse me, that these things continue to happen and people fight for change. And I do think because we've seen so many cases of police officers using, using deadly force, killing particularly people of color that are swept from the headlines, Trayvon Martin, um, things like that. But something about George Floyd and what happened afterwards feels different. People feel like they're talking about it more. And and with the Black Lives Matter movement growing and getting backing from all types of people, whether it be celebrities or companies, however you want to take that, how genuine they are, I think it is hopefully going to affect more change in terms of defunding the police, in terms of being it, making it easier to call officers out when they use excessive force and get them to face consequences for it. I think you're absolutely right. I think, I think change has been brewing for quite some time now. I think the environment is more than ready for it. I think we get, I don't think we can survive too many more of these types of incidents without it, it really tearing the country apart. We, as a country, have, a, have this stain of how we've treated African Americans since before this country was founded. And we can't erase that stain. Uh, what we can do is we can help to prevent it from perpetuating itself moving forward. Um, what we're doing today is very little different than what, you know, the KKK was doing in the 1800s, lynching free black slaves. We're better than this as a country. We need to be better than this as a country. You know, for the sake of, of the country and the sake of our children, we need to be better individuals. And we as, you know, I can say that from a position of white privilege. And, and you know, I, I, I am white privileged. And, and that is just by society standards. But Everyone should be free from the fear of ridiculous repercussions from the police. I've, I've watched a number of podcasts on this subject already and, and news interviews and broadcasts. And the level of anxiety that I experience if I get pulled over by police pales in comparison to what an African-American does. And we're talking some very affluent African-Americans who get pulled over and are treated like criminals just by default. And that premeditated discrimination is what leads to these situations. And I think we're ready for a change. I think before we reach that change, I think we've got some work to do. Uh, our current administration is not going to allow the changes that need to be happening. Um, we need to have an administration change, whether it's in November or four years from November. I don't know, but I can tell you that under the current administration, 
we're not going to be allowed to do the things that we need to do to make things right or to even start to make things right. Um, I don't, like I said, we can't erase that, that stain. So we can never make things right. What we can do is make things better. We can have a better future. And sadly, with the leadership that we have today, we're not going to be allowed to do that because every effort that we make today is going to find unreasonable resistance from the administration. So we're probably months away from any real change, but I think society is going to demand that change regardless. So that's my two cents on it. Did you want to add anything? Uh, just like I said at the top of the hour, um, I, I do really think it's important to donate if you can. I know it's it's tough with the pandemic financially for everybody, but if you can donate to a lot of organizations, um, you it's it's good. Sign petitions, even if you don't think it helps, it does because it contributes to that social outcry. And especially if you're from a position of privilege, one of the biggest things you can do is have difficult conversations with people that you know. I've had to do it. Confront them about if they're casually racist or things like that, confront them about their stance on police. If they, if they advocate for police excessive force or for just racism in certain situations, you have to be the one to say something because people aren't going to change because they see a news story, right? People are going to change because their friends and family say, Hey, this is wrong. What you're seeing on TV, these people being killed is wrong, you know? And I think that that's one of the ways that real change uh, can be brought about. Very well said. I agree with you 100%. I think that was all we had today. We did run a little bit late, but I definitely think it was a topic that uh, was worth covering. Before we go, I do want to invite folks to uh, check out our long-form uh, articles on Medium. You can get those at medium.com slash insights into things. Uh, we would love to hear feedback from you uh, on what we're talking about, what your opinions are, and what you'd like to hear more of us talk more about you can email us at comments at insights into things.com you can get us on twitter at insights underscore things all of our videos are available on youtube at youtube.com slash insights into things or you can get all of our uh, content on our website at insights into things.com and we do stream uh, six days, in this case, seven days this week uh, on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things. Anything else you want to say before we go? Nope. All right. Then I think that's it. Another one in the books. Bye.